Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for human sexuality. In this lecture we'll be talking about sexual orientation and gender. Let's get started by watching a video. Gender and sexuality is a complicated subject. The concept of males and females, homosexuals and heterosexuals, even bisexuals are common, but few people know that there's a much broader spectrum. Because of a lack of information, many teens have a hard time figuring out their sexual and gender identity. Without a proper education, they can struggle with their identity well into adulthood and even their whole life. Sexualities Most people know that heterosexuality means to feel sexual attraction to people of the opposite sex. Homosexuality means to feel attraction to people of the same sex. And bisexuality is experiencing sexual attraction to both males and females. But there's more. Pansexual people, also known as omnisexual, can experience attraction to all sexes and gender identities. An asexual person is someone that doesn't experience sexual attraction to any sex or gender at all. However, this doesn't mean that they aren't open to, or can't experience, romantic attraction. Romantic attraction is a feeling that causes people to desire a romantic relationship with a specific other person that doesn't necessarily involve sex. Heteroromantic, homoromantic, biromantic, panromantic, and aromantic are all types of romantic attraction. And these can be mixed to fit with other types of sexual attraction. An example of this is bisexual and homoromantic. Gender. There is more than just male and female in the gender spectrum. Intersex is when a person is born with both male and female parts, usually having an XXY chromosome. They can choose which gender they would like to be identified as, or they can identify as neither. Non-binary is when a person chooses to identify as neither male nor female, usually taking on different pronouns like she, zhe, jim, or z, zer, zim. Gender fluid can also fit into the spectrum of gender identities. A person who is gender fluid changes their gender identity that best fits with how they're feeling, changing from male to female to neither. Being cisgendered means you identify as the sex you were born as. Females identify as females and males identify as males. Transgender and transsexual people identify as a gender different from the biological sex they were born with. So a person born as a female may identify as a male later in life, and vice versa. While the two terms can be used interchangeably, transsexual usually refers to someone who has changed their appearance and undergone a sex change, while a person who identifies as transgender usually changes their appearance only. This is not to be confused with drag, which is a performance art. How to's Sexuality is loose, and labels like these are here to help people feel comfortable or like they have a place to belong. An important tip to remember is if you aren't sure how a person identifies, just ask. Appropriate pronouns are important to everyone. If you aren't sure, a safe way to go is using them, they pronouns. Say you have a friend or know someone that falls under one of these sexualities or gender identities and you aren't sure how to treat them. One easy way to respect someone's sexuality and gender is to never assume anything. Just because someone who identifies as bisexual is dating someone of the opposite sex, that doesn't mean they're suddenly straight. This applies to every sexuality. Help and information. It's common for people to have a hard time figuring out who they are. If you're in a situation like this, that's okay. Getting love and support from your friends and family is one of the most important things about finding yourself and your identity. Counseling is another option if you're having trouble. Online support groups can help you connect to other people who are dealing with similar challenges. If you still find yourself in a slump, eating right, exercising, and doing things that make you happy can help you through your confusion. For some counseling, you can call the GLBT National Hotline. They'll be more than happy to help.
So that video was a good primer of the things we're going to talk about here. Not everything in that video is things I'm going to talk about, but it gives a good overview as well as adding to what I'm going to talk about. So let's first talk about sexual orientation. Before we even get into sexuality, let's look at sexual orientation and then we'll kind of loop back to this. So sexual orientation is the direction of one's sexual interest. Pretty self-explanatory. For sexual orientation, you can have heterosexual, which is attraction and preference for romantic relationships with the other gender. Homosexual, which is attraction and preference for romantic relationships with the same gender. Bisexual, attraction and interest for romantic relationships, both genders. And asexual that I'm not talking about here, which is really no a non directed sexual attraction, the video talked about it. Uh, one thing I'll say here, a good did you know, sexual and feelings involving people of one's own gender are actually common in adolescence. It doesn't mean that someone will turn out to be homosexual in adulthood. Also, uh, and we'll talk about the Kinsey scales in a minute, but very few people in actuality are 100% heterosexual or 100% homosexual tend to have strong leanings in one direction or another, but maybe a little bit in their at least mind, uh, even if it's not behaviors, uh, in other directions. Also, and this is something I'm not really, I don't have slides for, but it specific to this last one, these um, feelings involving people of one's own gender in adolescence. There are actually cultures and societies where this is completely common and normal, where during early adolescence, uh, especially boys will have attractions towards other boys, and it's common and accepted and actually even encouraged, but then once they reach adulthood, it becomes discouraged. So there's a little bit of good and a little bit of bad there. So to talk about the Kinsey scale, the Kinsey scale is a seven point scale that goes from zero exclusively heterosexual to six exclusively homosexual um, with three equal. And you've got these ones and twos that are leaning towards heterosexual with some homosexual um, or five, fours and fives that are leaning towards homosexual with some heterosexual. And again, as I was saying, what's actually found is that not this scale specifically, but if you looked at actual feelings, desire, fantasy, that even people who are think they're a zero or a six tend to actually be closer to a one or a five with that, that when we're not talking about just behavior. That is the problem with this scale though. This scale is just looking at actual behaviors you've had. It doesn't look at feelings, desire, and fantasy. It's when you start to look at that feelings, desire, and fantasy that we get a picture that better elucidates how people actually feel. I want to talk about attitudes for a minute, and I do talk about attitudes from a historical perspective. So an older U.S. survey. I, I'm going to point out that this isn't necessarily the case anymore, but a older U.S. survey found that males between age 15 and 19, 90% of them said they felt that sex between gay men was disgusting, and 60% would not even consider being friends with a gay man. I bring these up because we're definitely shifting away from that. The attitudes have shifted over time. This is actually, these numbers are lower than they were 50, 60 years ago. And the, the, the numbers even today are much lower than this. And they are continuing to be lower as we come, become more socially progressive as a society. So as a society, we are more accepting of homosexuality now. If you ask someone 30, 40 years ago, if they would expect, have expected same-sex marriage to become legal, almost everyone would have said no. Well, now it is legal. So we're at a point where these attitudes are shifting. And it's good to know the historical attitudes, but it's also a positive note to note that we are getting to a point where things like this are becoming more accepted. Uh, 
now we're going to transition kind of into when we're talking about sexual orientation, but look at, well, what are some of the causes of it? And one thing we're going to look at here is genetics. So there is evidence that, that sexual orientation runs in families. So if one of an identical twin set of identical twins is gay, there's between a 50 and a 65% chance that the other one is also gay. That's compared to 22% of fraternal twins. So that is much higher. And relating to that, when we look at physical differences, autopsies have found that a segment of the brain's hypothalamus is less than half the size of a heterosexual in a homosexual individual. That's only one section of the hypothalamus. We're not talking about the entire hypothalamus, the entire brain. Just one portion is different. There's a large difference in size. So there is something biological going on. To take that even farther, so geneticists have been searching for a gay gene. Now, gay gene, and I put quotes in the air when I say gay gene, that's not to say that there's one specific gene. Just like anything else, it's probably polygenetic, it's probably many different genetic factors that go in together, and geneticists even agree that it's not just genetic, that there are environmental factors. If it was just genetic, then if one twin was was gay than the other one would be in, in almost all cases. But since it's only about a 50 to 65%, then there is environmental factors that go in as well, even if there is this genetic component. So there is the, the small difference found in, in the size of the hypothalamus, and you do find s some similar markers on the X chromosome, indicating that there is a genetic basis between the two a gay dog, buffalo, and lion walk into an Indiana bar. The bartender says, we don't serve your kind here. Whoa, 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 whoa. I wouldn't turn a lion away. That's discrimination. He's not lying. Howdy, friends. Trace here for D News with a special guest, Natalia Reagan. She is an anthropologist and a primatologist and she's awesome. Hey guys, uh, there's currently a great debate raging across the United States about a law in Indiana which allegedly allows businesses to discriminate based on religious freedoms, ironically called the Religious Freedom Act, sparking outrage from the LGBT community as they are clear targets of this legislation. Discrimination and prejudice has evolutionary roots, but then again, so does homosexuality. Research done in the 90s and early 2000s looked at sheep's sexual orientation, as they are some of the gayest animals in the animal kingdom. As many in one in 10 rams can be gay and will live exclusively gay lives with only male partners, even with fertile females around. The researchers believe they found a biological underpinning for homosexuality by studying these rams' hypothalamuses. Gay rams' hypothalami maybe was biologically different than straight rams. Baba, they were born this way. You know it. It's not just sheep. More than 450 vertebrates and more than 1,500 species overall engage in homosexual acts aplenty, illustrating that homosexuality isn't against nature. It's completely part of nature. Beetles, birds, bonobos, bats. Dolphins, orangutans, macaques, and penguins. Dragonflies, albatross, dogs and cats, even lions all exhibit homosexual behavior. Yep, that mighty king of the jungle ain't afraid to engage in a little spooning, sporking, and even forking of the same sex. But why? Why would nature evolve something that seems counter to evolution? Right? If the origin of species is correct and we're all here to achieve reproductive success, allowing us to spread our genes far and wide, then why would organisms evolve not to do that? Science is still working on it. There are a number of theories, though. Female Japanese macaques were observed mounting each other even when suitable males are around, and they hypothesize it may be a way to climb the social ladder by becoming a dominant female in a social group and thus gaining influence and resources. Though other researchers claim that homosexual behavior could come down to something as simple as seeking pleasure. These animals are just doing what feels good. Research with giraffes found one in 20 would be necking with a member of the same sex at any given moment, while bonobos and dolphins are generally bisexual, uh, but will go through phases of exclusive homosexual activity. They gotta give it the old college try, right? But it's not just for show. Some animals sustain lifelong homosexual relationships, like penguins. Researchers from the University of Minnesota found permanently pair-bonded female-female couples raise chicks nearly as well as female-male couples. Not quite as well 
but better than a single female penguin would have done. This indicates to those researchers that homosexual pair bonds may have evolved as a way to better raise young. They can even raise chicks that were fertilized by a dominant male that was separate from the pair bond without having to pair bond with that male. Benefits all around. Totally. Roy and Silo, two male chinstrap penguins that once lived at the Central Park Zoo, had a long-term love affair that included an adoption of a chick. The two remained together for six years until Silo found his eyes were wandering to a newly introduced female named Scrappy. So just because Roy stupped Silo yesterday doesn't mean he can't get down with Scrappy today too, right? Right? Cool. Yeah, if these animals can teach us something, it's that sexuality is not static or fixed, but fluid and flexible. Obviously, y'all are gonna have comments about this. So go down into the comments section and leave them there. You can also subscribe for more DNews. And Natalia, where can they find you if they wanna learn more? They can actually find me on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel, Natalia13Reagan. Please subscribe and see some fun science comedy videos. Thanks for watching, everybody. So I'm not gonna go on too much about the, the, what was in the video other than gonna look at this this slide's a good example and this slide just shows some of what's been found in nature just note that when the the argument that it's not in nature even though we're we should just completely ignore this argument anyway about homosexuality in nature because that's the naturalistic fallacy if you say well it's not in nature then it's not natural no that's the naturalistic fallacy if it's in nature it doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad if it's not in nature it doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad but in actuality the counter to that argument that that there isn't homosexuality in nature is that any zoo worker any biologist will tell you that there are literally hundreds of species out there that we have found that have homosexuality that occurs. Like Roy and Silo that you heard about very briefly in the video, but Roy and Silo uh, were at the Central Park Zoo in a holding tank in 1998. Um, they're both male penguins. Uh, at breeding time, they would build nests together. They defended it from others, would stand straight up, stretch their wings, intertwine their necks. That's an indication in penguins that they're committed. Um, since penguins don't have genitals, they have clo I can never say this word, but they, uh, they just interlock those when it comes to breeding. Obviously, they can't reproduce, but... They, the zookeepers gave them a dummy egg at first to see if they would incubate it, and they did, as normal couples did. Then they gave them a real fertilized egg, it hatched later, um, and they, they cared for that female. Uh, both of them did equal duty, just like in normal penguins, uh, and they kept her warm, they took care of her until she could take care of herself. As you saw from the video, things changed later, but for many years, they were together as a couple in the zoo. So let's transition into this talk about sex, sexuality, and gender. So first, they are different things. So the things you see on this slide, there's some interesting things here. Most of these are more transgender things like the Tom in Thailand, which are uh, women that dress up as men. Uh, you've got Castor here who is uh, has all by all appearances by all external appearances female but as we talked about earlier in the semester uh, likely to be XXY or one of the other genetic uh, abnormalities and therefore has the genetics for masculinity and maleness and and testosterone and even maybe the internal organs of male but the external of female so first let's define sexuality what is sexuality first of all sexuality is a relatively new term um, it only came into usage in the late 18th century and in its original usage it just usually meant reproduction through sexual activity amongst plants and animals and um, the, the 1830s, it started to be used in discourse relating to love and sex matters. So sexuality itself is a relatively new term, even if it was understood that things like it existed before. 
it's only been about 200 years that we've actually had a term for it that was written in discourse. So what does it mean according to the dictionary? Well, the, the dictionary that you read depends. All different dictionaries have different definitions. Uh, one example, the Merriam-Webster 2013 edition had the quality or state of being sexual. That doesn't explain much. So what is sexuality? There's broad things that come into it. First of all, there's believed to be four intertwining strands of sexuality. The first one is sexual desire or attraction. So to, to whom, or in some cases what, someone is attracted, both physically and emotionally. So sexual desire or attraction is our first component of sexuality. The second component of sexuality is activity or behavior. So what a person does or likes to do sexually, um, intercourse, masturbation, sexual fetishes, these types of things are a component of sexuality. So we've got desire and attraction, we've got behavior. Third, we've got your sexual identity. This is where we go back to what we already talked about. That's kind of the reason I talked about sexual orientation first, because it's, it's good to get that out of the way before we look at sexuality, because someone's sexuality isn't just their sexual identity or their sexual orientation. That is a component of it, though. So we've got sexual identity as a component of sexuality. So are you heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, asexual, that type of thing? The next is your sexual experience makes up your sexual your sexuality. So uh, education or training related to sexuality, experiences that you have had, and the experiences don't even the don't necessarily need to be consensual. It's more of when we're looking at sexuality, this component of sexuality, we're looking at experiences you've had. And observations of other sexualities is also a component of this. So watching porn or voyeurism, that type of thing, makes up sexual experience as well. So we've got these four overlapping matrices. These pictures that we've got here are kind of interesting. So now we start to ask questions. Are these images of sex, sexuality, or gender? Are they images of someone's gender? Are they images of someone having sex? Are they images of someone's sexuality? The, in the, the reason I show these pictures is because it is very likely that what you're seeing isn't what you are actually thinking because there are cultural differences in what is sexuality. There are cultural differences in what is not part of sexuality. It could be that being topless is not part of sexuality. It could be that guys touching each other intimately like these guys appear to be doing is a normal component of the culture that they're from that that isn't a sexual thing. These, are these images of sex, sexuality, or gender? These are actually images of sport. There is no sexuality involved in these. It's a sport in which they basically have to wrestle their opponent to the ground. And yes, hands do go down pants, but it's not in a sexual way. So, sexuality is more than just intercourse. Sexuality has many components to it. It's our thoughts, our feelings, our behaviors that are, we associate with being male, with being female. It's our experiencing attraction. It's our being in love. It's our being in relationships that include sexual intimacy and activity. It's all these different things that we've been talking about. It's our identity. It's our desire. It's our actual experiences. It, sexuality is so hard to define because it includes so much. So let's look a little bit more at these different circles of sexuality, these different types of sexuality that exist. At the top here, we have sensuality. So sensuality is your body image, your sexual response you may have to your desire to touch, to things like that. It includes fantasy, 
physical attraction, human touch. Then we've got intimacy. Intimacy is also a component of sexuality. It's our caring, our sharing, our loving, our liking, all the stuff we talked about with, about intimacy from that previous set of slides. Sexuality, though, does include our sexual identity. So our, as well as our sexual identity, is our gender identity, our gender roles, our sexual orientation, our gender bias, these gender things that we're going to talk about in just a couple slides. It's also our sexual health and reproduction. It's our feelings and attitudes about, the, about sexual practices. It's our knowledge about anatomy and reproductive organs. And it's actual acts of sexual reproduction. So it's the, these things we've been talking about this semester, as well as actual sexual reproduction. And then, of course, it's sexualization. So when it comes to things like flirting, seducing, sexual harassment, withholding sex, these are part of sexuality and sexualization. But even rape and incest are components that need to be considered. Next, let's talk about sex and gender. So we've talked about sexuality. Let's look at sex and gender. There is a difference between sex and gender. So biological sex is our physical characteristics that define male and female. It is XX or XY. Or all of those genetic abnormalities that we talked about before. But our biological sex is the physical characteristics as well as the genetic makeup. Whereas our gender is related more to society and culture. So gender is the features that a society associates or considers appropriate for men and women. Or another term you'll hear is maleness and femaleness. So um, gender is what society is says is appropriate for maleness and femaleness or what those that are male and female should, how they should act and behave. Virtually all societies expect the two sexes to take on different gender roles and the norms that each society has makes up gender stereotypes for that society. Um, and then once you take gender roles and stereotypes together, that affects how we perceive ourselves and other people. And again, this is more relating to what is expected of males and females or what is typical of maleness and femaleness. Why do these differences exist? Well, in many societies, women's role of nurturer and childbearer shape their gender role norms. So what we get here is at the heart of the gender or of the role of nurturer is uh, communality. So community, um, an orientation that emphasizes connectedness to others and includes traits of emotionally and sensitivity to others. In many societies, the aspect of the male gender role is agency. This is an orientation towards individual action and achievement. So in this case, looking at um, basically be resource gathering, being the breadwinner, being the one who's the defender, the protector, that type of thing. So let's look at gender. First, Social, socialization is learning the society's expectations for gender. So gender socialization is when we learn the expectations for behavior that a society has. Children learn this at a very young age. They learn this, typically they start to learn this even before they can talk and walk. Gender roles are how maleness and femaleness is expressed. So these gender roles we've been talking about and how this different male gender roles or masculine gender roles versus female gender roles or feminine gender roles. It's basically how the maleness or femaleness is expressed for each of those. Our gender identity is your personal sense of being masculine or feminine or your sense of maleness or femaleness. So our gender identity, this is something we've become much more open and accepting of lately. And this is how you get individuals who are transgendered or the, the various different other things you saw in the first video. And that specifically transgendered is having a gender identity that doesn't match your biological sex. 
So our general stereotypes and gener generalizations concerning how men and women should express themselves and characteristics each possess, these are what society makes as the, the standards, the stereotypes and generalizations. These um, are what mo each society it's different in and how each of these societies basically views maleness and femaleness. The last thing I'll talk about is androgyny. So androgyny is basically defined as showing the characteristics of both genders. Androgyny is a very interesting one in that over the, the years, each successive generation has become more androgynous than the last. So as the years go by, people, children growing up and becoming adults show more characteristics of the opposite gender of themselves. So males show both, so obviously maleness characteristics, but they also are starting to show more femaleness characteristics. Females show femaleness characteristics, but they're starting to show male, more maleness characteristics. And so each successive generation, we're becoming more androgynous. And you see the pictures here on the right, we've got Arya, who in Game of Thrones was a girl pretending to be a boy. And on the left, we've got Bieber, who is a boy pretending to be a musician. Now, if I said that in class, I'd hear you laughing. I can probably still hear some of you laughing. It's a bad joke, but it does show that you see this, that people are becoming more androgynous generation after generation. I will say, though, there are some pushbacks to this, like with Bieber you've got here. Look at some pictures of him now. I don't have it here. You can look it up and Google it, but you can see that he has become hyper-masculine, and that is because he got made fun of for having feminine characteristics as a teenager. So as an adult, he's becoming hyper-masculine and basically uh, trying to push back against that. So we've come a long ways. We're becoming more androgynous, which is a good thing, but we're still not there yet. Okay, on the next slide, I have a video, but this is the end of the lecture. You can watch that video. It's a very good TED Talk by a transgender woman and what it's like being a transgender woman. Thank you. Come on back. So just to finish up this lecture, uh, here's a YouTube link. Uh, I could have played it in it, but it's a 15 minute TED talk that is very useful. I recommend that you go and watch it. Thanks. Come on back.